Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Spotlight Talk on the AI, Labor and the Economy Issue Area at the Partnership on AI. My name is Katya Klinova. I oversee uh, the work of the AI, Labor and the Economy Research Programs. I'm an economist and computer scientist by training. I joined PEI about a year ago to build out our strategy for labor and economy, which we're going to talk about today. In this work and in this talk, I'm joined by my colleague, Pika Velo, who I'm going to turn it over to introduce themselves. Thank you, Katya. My name is B. Cavallo. As Katya mentioned, I am also working in the AI, labor, and economy issue area. My background is from tech industry as well as game design um, and arts and education nonprofit space. And I bring these things together, really leading especially our partner engagement and, and multi-stakeholder facilitation in this important area of work. Thank you, B. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a high-level overview of the strategy of AI labor in the economy issue area, and then we're going to dive deeper into the two flagship programs that we, are, we have active right now. So a simplified way to think about the labor and economy strategy at the AI is, think, th is think about the economic future that AI is bringing about and ask questions about whether jobs are going to be available to everyone who wants to have a job and whether those jobs are going to be of decent quality and afford uh, people the kind of living that they would like to have and in a non-precarious conditions. The two programs that we have that support these two pillars are the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative and the AI Supply Line Responsible Sourcing. Here's a 5,000 feet view at both of these programs. When it comes to the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative, what we're look, really looking at here are the alarm bells that many economists have been raising about uh, the AI development being channeled disproportionately into labor-saving applications, um, which can exacerbate inequality, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So with this project, we are creating awareness of that trend and we are creating practical frameworks for our partners to follow, to think about the implication, the economic implications of the innovations they're bringing into the world and how those impact the distribution of economic opportunity and especially the availability of earning opportunities for workers at the lower um, end of um, educational level attainment. When it comes to the AI supply line responsible sourcing, and in general, when it comes to thinking about quality of jobs that AI is bringing about um, in, in our present, you can't help but think about the gig economy and the precarity that right now it is accompanied with, because really the social and legislative infrastructure for on-demand work is lacking, um, which does create um, a precarious conditions under which many of the workers that supply labor to label data um, and prepare data that is used to train AI algorithms are then used. This labor is really central to the production of many AI products and services, but it is often um, remains in a hidden state. It, it's not reflected in the traditional AI, in the traditional supply chain reports, but um, it's really something that we think should be there. And it's something that um, we think is worth paying attention because this is one of the fastest growing uh, new professions in the, uh, in the platform economy. And with this project, we are looking at creating guidance that uh, people who procure and source data labeling work, which is often data scientists, engineers, machine learning practitioners, product managers, uh, the guidance that they can use to think about workers' well-being and the working conditions in the data enrichment supply chain at every step of their sourcing process. If you'd like to dive deeper into one of these projects, you can uh, refer to time codes below and jump through the video. For now, I'm going to dive deeper into the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. So here's, the motivation, here's where the motivation for this project is really coming from. In the last few years, I'm sure many of you uh, have seen 
many of the sets of so-called responsible AI principles or ethical AI principles. And many of those include language around the distribution of gains from AI. So for example, here's one of the first sets that was published uh, in uh, the Asilomar set, and it does have a principle that states, and I quote, the economic prosperity created by AI should be shared broadly to benefit all of humanity. This is a beautiful principle, and we are really happy to see that many of our partner organizations have subscribed to a version of this. But now, if you take a step back and think about what does it mean in practice to implement this principle, to bring it into the AI development and research process, uh, there is not really that much guidance out there for this. If you followed mainstream economic thinking up until fairly recently, you might have even uh, gotten an impression that after you subscribe to a principle like this, there is not much that you need to change in effect in your practice of AI development. Because as we knew back then, technological progress is something that uh, drives productivity and, and the productivity growth is this um, tide that lifts all boats, economists will say. But then most recently, there has been economic thinking emerging that really started to differentiate between the kinds of technologies that are being put out there and started to distinguish that not all of them really lift all boats as it was um, predicted. And I want to acknowledge that it's actually quite hard when you're looking at a piece of technology to necessarily understand if it's, um, if it's the kind that advances shared prosperity or if it's a kind that maybe advances inequality, really. So I'll give you an example. Here's an incredible piece of technology. This is a stealth order kiosk. With a couple of taps, you can get food to come out. This you know, works like pure magic. Is this the kind of technology that lifts all boats and advances shared prosperity? You can you know, maybe pause this video and think a little bit about that. Now, would your assessment of that, would, you, would your answer to this question change if I told you that this picture was taken in South Africa last year, so pre-COVID, and at the time of when this picture was made, the unemployment in South Africa was 29%. So South Africa, just like many countries around the world, faces a dire need of formal sector jobs. And when technology is taking those away, that might not be necessarily something that is the most helpful or most valuable for an economy in that condition. Um, so you might be thinking, what is a self-order kiosk doing in South Africa? And what really happened was that when a company made an investment into an AI startup that developed a technology that powers these kiosks. They made this investment in California and maybe it was economically justified in the United States. But once the investment is made, then the technology knows no borders and it gets deployed all around the world in 120 markets. And so it doesn't matter how low the workers in those markets might be trying to push their wages to compete with this, they cannot. Uh, the investment is made and the marginal cost of deploying it in yet another country is pushed to near zero. There is a, an interesting backstory to that. Uh, the company claimed that they started developing this technology or made this investment in response to a fight for increasing uh, minimum wage in the US. This was in the US, but the consequences are seen all around the world. Now, we end up with this in a situation in which we dedicate, in the words of, in the words of Len Pritchett, the world's scarcest economic factors, which is entrepreneurial and um, engineering and scientific talent, to economizing on one of the world's most abundant factors uh, and resources, which is human labor, and especially lower and medium skilled labor. And that would be just an unfortunate waste of innovation, uh, but th there are actually more consequences to that, and let's dive into those. When you, when you were looking at this self-order kiosk, uh, you might have thought to yourself, well, there has always been innovation and technology has always displaced some work, but also has created new work for people as well. And indeed, you're right, this has been the trend uh, that we've seen for a while. The question is, 
Thus, the volume of newly created tasks for humans and the volume of the displaced tasks match up and keep pace with each other. And uh, what I'm showing you are the graphs from a paper by Verona Chimoglu and Pascual Restrepo from last year. And these graphs show that indeed, in the four decades following World War II, um, the pace of um, automation and the pace of creation of new tasks for humans, uh, they more or less matched. But then something happened when the computer age came about and uh, what we're seeing these days is that the that automation by far outpaces Wynn's statement, the creation of new tasks. The other factor that is really um, important for understanding whether people whose jobs have been automated can move um, and pick up new work, if new work is available to them, is understanding if these new tasks require the same kind of skills that the tasks that are being displaced. And again, what we are seeing here is that a lot of the new tasks really are created for people with certain kinds of advanced education. And this is why, this is the data from the US, this is why the, the demand for labor of these people goes up and up and up, their wages are growing, while the wages of people without college degrees are falling. This a phenomenon is, um, illustrates a skill gap and a skill bias of technological change. Skill bias of technological change is this phenomenon when the technological change, uh, instead of lifting all boats, as we would hope, uh, benefits people with certain kinds of skills, with certain kinds of educational backgrounds, and not everyone else. Actually, sometimes at the expense of everyone else, everyone else's labor is less, becomes less valued in the economy and in the market. So what can we do about this? The AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative is really not only a research effort, but it is also a paradigm shift effort. So it challenges the premise and the expectation that AI is going to transform what kind of need, what kind of skills are valued by the market and are valued in the economy. And this is something that society will have to adjust to. So workers would continue, are expected right now to continuously upskill themselves, keep pace with technological change. Uh, governments are expected to strengthen social safety nets, provide benefits like UBI. And while none of that None of those prescriptions or recipes are bad or wrong, but we believe this is not enough because there is another very pl powerful player in the, in the ecosystem, and this is the very AI industry. And so the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative asks a question, kind of flips the question on its head and asks how the trajectory of AI instead can be adjusted to make the adjustments accept, expected of the society and of workers less burdensome and more easy to navigate. So it does shift the burden of adjustment away from workers and towards the AI industry and asks us to recognize its responsibility to think about the kind of economic future that it's bringing about into the world. But of course, for the AI industry to meaningfully own that responsibility and to act on it, there needs to be a practical way to do that. And so the research part of the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative is dedicating to developing practical framework for handling the redistributive power of AI responsibly. The working title that we're using temporarily for that framework is Redistribution Aware AI Development Framework. If you do have suggestions for better names, please reach out to us. We're going to share our emails at the end of this talk. Uh, now, what does it mean? What, what would this uh, framework really uh, entail in practice and include in practice? Let me describe it to you by giving you a parallel example that uh, one of the steering committee members of the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative, Professor Achimogu, is very often using. Think about the responsible approach to environmental impact that many of the businesses have taken up in recent years. There is now actually a very, um, a very concise and clear 
um, theoretical infrastructure or theoretical framework for acting on re environmental responsibilities of businesses. It is clear what kind of goals they can set for themselves. This, this is something around emission reductions or getting to zero emissions. It is clear we've developed ways how to measure the progress towards a goal like this, uh, how to measure emissions. And there are clear prescriptions or policies that companies can adopt to make progress. And that's probably something around waste management or energy management. Now, when it comes to AI and inequality, none of that exists. So if a company wants to uh, take a responsible approach towards thinking about their impact on economic inclusion and inequality, it is totally unclear what the goal, what the right goal is for them to set for themselves, how to measure progress towards that goal, and what are the concrete steps they can be taking taking in order to make progress towards that goal. All of this intellectual um, research, theoretical basis and infrastructure um, is something that the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative is developing. Uh, this is a look under the hood of the initiative and how we are structuring it. We are, uh, as I already described, in the end of the day, when I get at this practical framework, redistribution aware AI development framework. Now to get there, there are a lot of um, research questions that we're gonna need to address uh, to make the framework robust. So we are starting by creating a research agenda for the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative that we are gonna be sharing next year publicly and soliciting public input towards and also expert input towards. And we're hoping that many of you are also going to be willing to comment on that and share our thoughts. We are also publishing it not only to get comments, but hoping that many researchers and organizations are going to feel uh, compelled to contribute their own questions and take up some of the research questions in this agenda in their own work and in their own research. But the very first vehicles through which we are collecting uh, inputs into shaping this agenda is through a steering committee that we've assembled for the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. The steering committee is in deliberations now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a couple more words about that. And once there is a first draft of the agenda, we're also gonna workshop it in focus groups with key stakeholders such as workers around the world and product managers, AI developers and researchers. Here's the uh, steering committee. It's 23 people from a variety of disciplines uh, all around the world. We have um, labor representatives and uh, worker group representatives. Uh, we have technologists, we have leading social scientists, thinkers from um, ethics uh, fields uh, um, and human rights um, advocates uh, and civil society from um, across the partnership network. They, you can follow the deliberations of the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative Steering Committee by following the Partnership on AI handle or subscribing to um, a newsletter. And I'm going to share a link at the end um, for where you can subscribe. So our plans, as I already um, briefly shared, are to release the research agenda next year and start an outreach campaign to solicit inputs into it and really raise the profile of this set of questions that unfortunately are getting neglected and are not really right now top of mind for the responsible AI community, which we think is really unfortunate. And then later that year, we're gonna, we hope to start piloting the early versions of the uh, redistribution aware AI development frameworks. And we hope that some of your organizations are gonna be interested in becoming pilot partners for that phase of the project. Please also reach out to me about that. We would really love to work with you. So I wanna end, um, the conversation about the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative by saying that the humankind can make smart choices about the path of technological progress. It is not predetermined. 
such choices have already been made before and there is an ongoing effort to steer um, you know, the energy technology towards towards the green um, green energy sources. And similarly, we can be making smart choices about the path of AI to guide it towards the creation of really inclusive global economic future. As I said, we would absolutely love for you to get involved. Here uh, is a web address, partnershiponai.org slash shared hyphen prosperity. There you can sign up to hear from us. We are going to be sending you updates on deliberation proceedings of the steering committee. We are going to be sending you project progress updates, event invitations, and invitations to comment on our prototypes and drafts. We hope to hear from you. We especially are looking for pilot partners. Please do get in touch. Now, um, we the second deep dive that we also want to give to you during the spotlight talk is on the AI supply line responsible sourcing project. So the, this project was really um, an effort and an idea from source from our partners. Uh, a lot of you, many, many of you may be watching this right now have participated in the early efforts to scope this project. It was scoped based on over two dozen of interviews with you all and we're really happy that now it is moving forward full steam ahead. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague B to tell you about the current status of this project, what is coming up for it really in the next few weeks, and then the plans that we have uh, for the coming uh, few months as well. Thank you, Katya. So as Katya mentioned, this is a project that was inspired by and enabled by our partners. But before we dive into the latest updates on the project, I want to give a little bit of background on what AI supply line responsible sourcing means and where this idea comes from. In particular, you know, there's this theory that um, Katya kind of mentioned around you know, accessibility of jobs, access to jobs, and then the quality of jobs. And one of the motivating beliefs in this work is that everyone, all the workers who are contributing to the development of AI systems should have healthy, fair, and empowering working conditions. And this work is in support of that goal. But there are a lot of workers involved in developing AI systems. This work, The Anatomy of an AI System, created by Kate Crawford and Vlad Yoler, details all of these different inputs, in this case to an Amazon Alexa, from the mining of the metals that go into this work to the, the data that is generated and, and compiled to train the AI models to the engineers who and designers who build the interfaces. So there are a lot of different workers involved, but we're gonna spoke, particularly focus on one subset of these workers with an eye toward this important factor. Aaron Corville, Ian Goodfellow, and Yashua Benjo wrote in their 2015 book, Deep Learning, the most important new development is that today we can provide these algorithms with the resources they need. Meaning that AI systems today are powerful in part because we're able to give them so much information, so much data that feeds into these systems. In fact, in many ways we could say that today's AI runs on data. Right. All of these algorithms, all of these new systems that we have for modern machine learning rely on data to actually function and to be trained to do all of the amazing things that they do. But it's not just any data that it takes. Today's AI runs on labeled data. Well, what does this mean? When we talk about labeled data, we mean teaching an AI system what we want it to pay attention to. What are the good things that we're looking for or the bad things that we're not? This can be um, the classic example of hot dog or not hot dog, giving examples of labeled images saying these are hot dogs or these are not. This could be examples of an email data set where people have labeled this email sounds sad or happy or angry. It could also be like in this example, actually highlighting which pixels in a still frame of a video are relevant to the, the subject of that video. This work, this labeling of information it takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of human processing power. And as Mary Gray said in a recent New York Times interview, this is an expanding world hidden beneath the technology. 
And it's hard to take humans out of the loop. There are people doing this work of labeling data, of enriching our data sets with new information so that we can teach our AI systems how to behave. And this is incredibly powerful. It is incredibly valuable. And that's why as we think about this larger ecosystem in which there are all of these many workers who are providing inputs into AI, we're focusing in right now on this section, the generation and labeling of data. So coming back to this idea that all workers contributing to the development of AI should have healthy, fair, and empowering working conditions, we have to wonder, well, what can we do about this situation? This is the basis of the AI Supply Line Responsible Sourcing Project. In this work, what we want to do is think deeply about how these workers, these data enrichment workers who are doing this labeling process can actually have the best working conditions possible. Now, we've heard from our partners on this topic that you know the, the, there are many people who are purchasing labeled data who really want to do well to compensate and honor the work of people who are doing that data enrichment behind the scenes, but it's complicated, it's confusing, and people don't actually know where to start. They say guidelines would be very helpful in terms of navigation, and they wanna have a good understanding of what's realistic to ask of people in terms of the pricing and the tasks that they're actually doing. This work is incredibly important, but it is confusing, and here's why. There are many ways that you can get labeled data. There are in-house enrichment practices, companies that are building AI systems pull from their own internal expertise, there are crowdsourcing or gig work platforms where people through the internet are connected with jobs. There are managed services that offer to have a, uh, a, a either full-time employed or contract labor force um, that manages the, the execution of the project. And there are also automated software and increasingly people are deploying AI systems to do a pre-processing step of labeling some of the data and giving those edge cases to the people as Mary described in that still persistent human in the loop. But the reality is these different sources of labeled data are actually not so different after all. Many sources, almost everyone who is developing or providing labeled data actually uses a suite of or a combination of these different approaches. And that can make it difficult for the people who are actually trying to source that data, the, the machine learning engineers, the developers and data scientists, the product managers, to know what is actually happening downstream. As Katya mentioned, we've had many conversations with people about this issue, and we've heard a lot of different working models. Some people have um, you know, work that goes through one of these managed providers. Some people go directly to gig work platforms. Across the board, there are many different um, kind of models, but there are some similarities as well. And what we've seen is that consistently AI product managers and data scientists are some of the key decision makers who actually set the terms of what are going to be the working conditions or payment of these data enrichment workers. Some of the things that we've recognized as considerations that people in this position of power should take are thinking about where they are actually sourcing their labeled data from, but it also thinks about how they can communicate throughout that process. For instance, running a pilot first to evaluate whether the instructions they've written for a task make sense and thinking about what those tasks are and how they're broken down. There can also be different types of task assignment depending on who's actually doing the task and what kind of background knowledge they might need. And of course, this all important question of pricing and terms. Other areas that can be beneficial are thinking about the communication channels between the people doing this work and the engineers who are actually um, building the systems and building the AI models. In one example, I've heard someone was talking about the challenge of a system distinguishing between pedestrians out on the roadway and vehicles. One of these edge cases that came up and consistently the people who were doing data enrichment were running into challenges with were garbage trucks. On a garbage truck, there's a person who rides on the back and oftentimes gets off and picks up the garbage can and connects it to the machine. Sometimes they're a pedestrian walking on the street, and sometimes they're essentially part of the vehicle. Having open lines of communication between the people who are doing data labeling work and the people who are trying to train the AI system is important to make sure that we can understand what the actual goal of the task is. 
And finally, as we think about how this work can lead to people's advancement and career, we want to think about what the offboarding is. What skills did people learn and how can we make sure that people have closure in the tasks that they've done? As we mentioned, this work has a history. In fact, it started in April of 2019 from our partners suggesting to us, um, telling us that this is an important area of need. And in January of this year, we kicked off with a bunch of different interviews and really developing this guide that we're now building for responsible sourcing. At this stage, we're conducting a workshop series on responsible sourcing of data enrichment services that will inform the guide and help us to look toward how we're going to implement this. Coming up on October 28th, I hope you will join us for our responsible sourcing partner social. Everyone is invited to deepen our conversation and understanding and to build our partner relationships. Following the workshop series through the fall and end of the year, we're going to be incorporating the learnings from from that workshop into our revisions and our next round of the draft. And in the spring of next year, we're going to be building out a workshop series specifically around designing the tools, the resources, the, the product that people who are actually doing this work in a day-to-day -day, um, space can use. So after that workshop series, we'll be moving on to publishing and piloting those tools and resources. And I hope that you all will join us for that. If you're interested in getting involved in the AI Supply Line Responsible Sourcing Project, here are a couple of ways that you can. We have the white paper that we've been drafting. You can help provide feedback and strengthen these recommendations so that we make sure we're making the right recommendations that can create the most clarity and benefit to everyone involved. We also have the design workshop series coming up in the spring where we'll be co-creating resources for implementation what tools are needed for a product manager or a data scientist to actually implement these recommendations we've made. Then we'll be piloting the implementation of these resources and we would love to find partners um, who want to join us in this effort. And through the fall, um, we'll hopefully be putting these into practice and really strengthening these recommendations out in the world. If you're interested in any of these different topics, I hope that you'll get in touch and you can reach me at b at partnershiponai.org. Another way that you can get involved is the forthcoming Responsible Sourcing Partner Social on October 28th. It will happen at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT. And if you'd like an invite to the social, I hope that you will join us. Um, feel free to email me as well. Finally, this work would not be made possible without our partners. And in particular, I want to call out just a couple of folks who have been tremendous, tremendous champions of this work. Mary, Heather, and Elle and I, who, without whose uh, brilliance, expertise, and dedication, I don't think this work could be made possible. But I also wanna thank all of you who've participated in our interviews, in the process of developing out what this um, project should be scoped as, and those of you yet to come who are going to work with us in piloting the resources that we make and the design workshops. So truly, thank you. This wouldn't be possible without partners like you. Finally, just to recap here, if you want to get involved, please contact me, be at partnershiponai.org. Come to our October 28th social, meet other partners who are thinking about these topics. Um, join us throughout the end of this year, strengthening our recommendations into resources in the spring and hopefully developing out and piloting our resources into 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, B, And thank you so much, everyone, for watching this video. If you've watched this far, you're probably really interested in this topic or working on it already. And if, you, if we are not yet in touch and we're not yet talking regularly, please do get in touch with us. We would absolutely love to hear from you. And we're really, really interested in knowing people in the partnership who are working on this topic or who are curious about these topics and want to contribute their expertise, their opinions, want to participate in the pilots or uh, just share thoughts with us and chat. So please do get in touch. We would absolutely love to hear from you. And thank you again very much for watching. Please check out some of the links that we mentioned throughout this video in the description of, um, the, of the video that you're watching. Thank you very much.